we're back. This is the Chat and Cheese podcast with the Sessions AI Frontline Series. I'm your co-host, Joel Cheeseman, joined as always, Chad Sowash. Matt, welcome back to the show. So when you're taking a look at the, obviously, the the, the meteoric rise of Chat GPT and OpenAI, uh, and then obviously Google has to come out with Gemini, and then we've got cloud and so on and so forth, but you've got all these competing models, but that's wonderful for uh, organizations in our space because it seems like business people are using those large language models on a daily basis. So to be able to start getting them into the adoption phase, it just feels like it's happening much faster. Are you seeing the same thing in the market? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that you are seeing a lot of, and in our space in particular, instances of essentially a vendor offering a white labeled version of one of those commercially available LLMs. Yeah. Here's the problem with that. There's so much compliance moving targets there between intellectual property, between how they're handling and processing sensitive data mm -hmm. that I, I, if I were in the profession right now, I would definitely cease my use of some of these instances until they've been fully vetted by both my CISO and my CIO. Uh, I think that that is sort of a, a sort of a misstep. So um, those lessons are being learned elsewhere in the organization. To my earlier point, I would go and seek out those stakeholders and try to figure it out because I should not be adding to the risk profile of the company if I'm in HR. I should be mitigating it. It seems like most companies at this point, not just in HR, but in sales and customer service, it's almost afraid like they, they're afraid that there's a bigger risk in losing to competition because competition's actually utilizing the, 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 uh, the, the large language models or the automation systems much better, right? And it almost feels like there's a bigger risk to lose out to competitors, or at least that's the, that's the narrative that's being pushed to be able to drive adoption in this. What do you think about that? I, I think that that's a, a great way for sales to create urgency. Yeah. However, I think that there are probably more downsides to being first to market than waiting and seeing. Mm -hmm. Namely, that if you're on the cutting edge, you often get cut. And, you know, you want to see a couple things. One, what mistakes are your competitors making? Mm -hmm. Two, is this something that I can fix independent of technology? Because if I can, then that means I have some structural advantages yeah. that my competition doesn't have. And I think third and most importantly is trying to see who has staying power among these vendors. Because what we're doing is we're giving a lot of very well-funded VC-backed startups yeah. keys to the kingdom in terms of our data and information without any sort of knowledge or foresight about are they going to be acquired by a PE? Where yeah. is that data going to go afterwards? Look at TikTok as a basic example. What happens to all that now? And, and I think that if you're a business, there's a very real risk if that vendor goes under that all of your data is compromised or used in a way that you're not going to want. Well, the current administration, though, is pretty much telling all the other countries, hey, back off our AI countries, our AI companies. So it seems like they're they're making the statement that don't worry, break stuff. There's not that much much risk while we're here. That's what it feels like. So it, it almost feels like companies feel like they can take that risk that that you're you're advising not to take. Yeah. Um, just because I mean, again, this is it feels like the Wild West and like the administration's like it is the Wild West. Just go break stuff. I would argue that in terms of AI savvy, mm -hmm. North Korea, in fact, is the most advanced nation in the world. Uh, we don't need to go into the reasons, oh, but yeah, yeah. let's just say protectionism when it comes to integrated operating systems yeah. is a fool's errand, as is probably listening to this administration and making decisions long term based off of their short term policy objectives. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of the administration, I want to touch on leadership uh, real quickly. Um, you you said something around DEI that said leadership in HR took a couple steps back because of that issue. And one of the things that we hear consistently around AI is that AI is going to take all the grunt work out of our job. And we're going to be able to focus more on big picture, vision, the business, having that seat at the table. And I can tell by your smirk, you're a little bit uh, not so bullish on that. Talk about where where that seat at the table is, how cold is it, how close is, is HR and recruiting to that, to that conversation with the execs. Yeah. So uh, the reason why I, I kind of sparked and, and why I brought up DEI is 
it was always, I think, readily obvious that given the multiple factors that go into that discipline and the significant money that we were investing in those initiatives, mm -hmm. proving ROI is going to be very, very, very difficult, mm -hmm. um, particularly when it comes to causation as opposed to correlation on outcome data. So for me, what this really again comes down to is your way to build credibility and seat at the table is to help your company basically make money more efficiently mm -hmm. and at less cost. So you need to be aligned with, and I'm sorry to be the capitalist here, at the end of the day, if you ask your CEO, you know, you can read all those polls, what keeps you up at night? AI, that's not true. It's it's shareholder returns, right? Oh, yeah. and, and, and giving them value. And if you can't prove that you're doing that, you're never gonna have strategic input. HR has had trouble, again, being able to prove that they are anything but a giant administrative cost center because of their inability to correlate with business outcomes. However, again, AI gives them the potential opportunity to be able to start showing how that works against the larger ecosystem and prove those outcomes in a way that we couldn't probably with any other generation of technology. So you do agree that the tools today do offer a path to us getting a seat at the table? If we can get our heads around data, being able to understand how to interpret it, dashboard it, analyze it, and manage it, then yes. But I think data literacy and financial literacy when it comes to just like FP&A and, and those sort of measures be really, really, really important. So if we get the quantitative part, mm -hmm. we've always been good at the qualitative. If we can make that business case, then I would agree with yeah. that. And my perspective is we have so much legacy, so much duct tape upon duct tape that just laying an AI, you know, on that is not going to achieve the results. I don't know, agree or disagree, but but I feel like it's just another layer that's going to keep us in the same in the same mud that we've been in for for decades. How do we strip away that duct tape? Can we? Because um, I don't think there's an organization in the world today that's trying to do more with fewer people, and maybe fewer so software is part of that as well. Your thoughts? Um, yep. Yeah. So I think that. Really, you're correct. When it comes down to technologies like this, we're able to really consolidate the amount of tools that are being used and probably get a little bit more value out of them. You had a very long prelude to that question, and so I totally blanked out on the meat of it. That's okay, and it's early. It's early in Las Vegas, so it's, it's okay. it is early in Las Vegas. I'll help you by saying I forgot the question. Let's see what Chad has to ask. Uh, yeah. So back to business outcomes. I think it's it's incredibly important that. TA, HR, talent as a whole uh, understands how they actually impact business, yeah. which means they have to actually go and make themselves a student of the business, um, which we haven't done, right? It's, yeah. it's, it's, and we want to talk about strategic and building talent pipelines and life cycles and those types of things, but yeah, we're focusing on the day to day. How do we actually, and we've talked to, we've talked to plenty of companies that have started to slowly eke in little pieces of AI right? Uh, that they see dramatic because of being in, in 20 year old tech, right? right? They see quick and easy uh, impact on business, being able to actually uh, redistribute individuals out to do other things, right? So instead of scheduling interviews and those types of things, you don't have a hundred people doing that anymore, which I thought was fucking crazy. Yeah. Um, but you can then redistribute those people and that, and then you can show that at least the first step of a business outcome to the C-suite and say, okay, we can make some really big changes if we start to retool how we do business. That's that's correct. And, and I would add to that, uh -huh. this is not a technological solution, but if you are creating efficiencies to open up time in your schedule for meaningful impact, then what I think it is imperative to your point that recruiters do is not say, oh, I have more time to talk to candidates or, you know, I have more time to to get to know like this or that about recruiting or look at more technologies. Spend that time actually having face to as much face to face interactions with both the hiring managers or your stakeholders mm -hmm. to understand like what their needs are, what they're looking for, what that business is about. And with the, the frontline workers who you're going to be recruiting their colleagues, I think that once that trust is established, Maybe then you can have a much more meaningful conversation about technology, but it will just be looked at as largely transactional if you're only able to 
deliver candidates cover letters and say make a decision yeah right and yeah. and so if you were just a messenger yeah you are going to be eliminated by ai or automation or whatever because we're moving towards a self-service model mm -hmm. the only way to prevent that again nothing with technology trust and expertise because the one advantage recruiters do have in an organization is they are the internal subject matter experts about the one thing that everyone cares about, mm -hmm. which is building and advancing their career. Yeah. Well, unilaterally, everyone in a company cares about that. I would leverage that fact and start getting my face out there because you, you as a person, would be much harder to replace. Yeah. A general recruiter who is filling recs, very easy, and that's probably been replaceable with technology that's existed for 20 years now. So the, the Shopify CEO has said and and it's it's just a different way to go at the at the question because ai's in it but uh pretty much says hey look you're going to have to prove to to me when you need to open a new rec that ai can't do that job and that's literally just challenging the hiring manager and the departments to say this is why i need those resources and the only difference because we've been doing this for years the only difference is they're throwing ai into it saying what can ai do so what what's your thought, especially coming from the CEO down uh, to to HR and the hiring managers? This to me feels like a gelling moment for both of those two. What, what do you think about that? And do you think it's going to be something that we see from more CEOs moving down the road? I think that throwing AI in is, is a good. I think it's an exercise that every organization go through. Oh yeah, sure. um, we're still using. It, it, people complain like job descriptions don't describe jobs. Yes, right. Yes. And the reason why is because we're using outdated compensation documents that are put in there with requirements for essentially like leveling and banding purposes. Yeah. So I think to go through and say, what do these jobs do, and do we actually need this position is probably a really good exercise regardless of how you look at it yeah um but if you're looking at ai through that filter i think that you also need to make it as like a determination can ai do the job is one but ai by particularly generative generative ai always is going to be average its its output is going to be the the median of everyone's input. Mm -hmm. So if you want quality, that's a variable that I would look for because particularly in positions like marketing or sales or other kind of high touch, uh, more ambiguous sorts of roles. Right. Quality is something that I would look at. Maybe AI could replace. Right. But I want to be better in the competition. Well, isn't it isn't it even smarter to break down the job description as in tasks because yes that job in itself is literally just a sequence of tasks that are happening what tasks within that job could actually be done by ai which could prospectively free up that individual to do more in different business impactful areas i think that that, that yes looking at at any jobs task yeah. again no matter how you slice it dice it a really good activity i would add though that you have to frame in terms of what is this job's intended contribution yeah. to the larger organization. The impact. Or the impact. Yeah. Because again, tasks may or may not align with that. And mm -hmm. if they don't, then that's something that AI can't fix. Yeah. You're going to have to as an HR department. Yeah, yeah. Well, Matt, thanks for hanging out with us today. Enjoy the rest of your time in Vegas. And for the Chat and Cheese podcast, this has been the AI Sessions, the Frontline Series. I'm Joel Cheeseman. That's Chad Sowash. Find out more about us at chadcheese.com. We out. We out.